let me ask you this, David. And I have a call to action for people to support David. You know, this this whole story, and along with, the, like he said, he's got the real letters from congressmen. Uh, it, it's at americasfallfromspace.com. I'm going to buy the DVD after we get done recording the show, maybe later tonight because we have another interview, but I'm going to buy the DVD because we can support David. He's a hero, and this is a call to action. And I know David has actually an emergency call to action for us because we talked before. That's how I know this. But let me ask you this, David. So this story is amazing. So your mom, she comes up with this. this she has this dream of, of what the, uh, the fusion containment rocket or the system you're building uh, you have uh, Curtis LeMay, General LeMay, and I guess you, you're building this so you don't blow up the house. You're building this outside <laughs> of your parents' house. You're a, you're a boy. How did What ended up happening with this rocket that you were building, that specific one? And then how does that morph into you getting black ops resources by the U.S. government and ending up at Area 51 <laughs> yeah. taking a look at an alien engine? Well, that's what... This thing just, I don't know, the whole project, now think back on it, they really didn't have control of it. It was just evolving on its own. There was outside forces causing things to happen, and there's so many details that we've just skipped over it's sure, in the film. We'll have to have you back. Actually, yeah, we well, one, one de- hours. Well, well, one detail, which is really important, um, LeMay didn't stick around me very long, just a couple of visits, and that was it. But on January 6th, 1968, that's 69. On January 6, 69, I get a knock on the front door, and it's a, it's a full bird colonel standing in front of me, and uh, his name is uh, Colonel Arthur Bailey Williams. Hmm. And he was the XO for General LeMay. And um, uh, now here's where I really give the critics a fit. <laughs> um, if you would call the probate judge in Maryville, Tennessee, and ask them who was the executor of Colonel Williams' estate, the judge will tell you David Tyson Adair. So if this is bull, how do you explain that? Now, which now can you can you repeat that again? Because I really this sounds important. I need to understand this. Well, it what it is when Colonel Williams. Uh, you know, was with me every day for 26 and a half months uh, building Pithlum. Uh, uh-huh. I had had an army of people, and I asked them, uh, don't show up at the house in uniform, wear blue jeans and plaid shirts, and the, the Air Force guys loved that. <laughs> so they were more than happy to comply, and LeMay thought that was an excellent idea, so they blend in with the, the farmers around us. So I didn't want to have all this Air Force personnel being seen. Sure. So, sure. um... So nobody knew he was doing this, but um, Colonel Williams there every day. So I got to know him really well. Well, jump 45, 48 years later, he dies, and his daughter's there, and she, and she's dying of Lou Gehrig's disease. She hears me on the radio. She calls, the, gets the radio to tell me that Colonel um, Williams' uh, daughter's calling. I, I never met her, but I knew of her. So I talked to her for a few minutes, and she is totally convinced I am the teenager that her dad used to talk about. Oh, wow. So she invites me over, and she makes me executor of the estate. Oh, wow. So, um, so that proves who I'm, that I knew Colonel Williams. He was real. I was there. It all happened. Because how do you Photoshop being an executor of a state? That's right. That's right. And there's many. That's one of many things. And oh, know- yeah. It, Oh, it's just one thing after another, another like that, that can be proven hardcore that all this happened. And it's hard proving a paper trail because a lot of it was purposely destroyed um, as the project went on because they were covering it up. But I still know where to look and find things and found it for the film crew. But um, there's just so too, too much documentation, real hard. It's all admissible to court, by the way. Ah. So, so if I was um, being on trial for lying, I can have all this admitted into court as evidence. Sure. And, you know, it's, yeah, people, I, again, I could, we made videos. We had one video just asking if Harp maybe 
is, is modifying the weather. Even though there's U.S. patents and the Air Force admits it, and people just comment F you. Like, they don't even watch what the, our video says. That, and we even say we forgive the government if there is wrongdoing. We say that in the video. And people just, I, I don't know who's so, uh, I, maybe it's, they're paid by the government. I don't know. Maybe it's just people that really are defending HARP. I don't, I don't know where those people come from. People that are really passionate about HARP not being a... <laughs> I don't even know anybody who knows about HARP. You probably do. But my point is, yeah, people just question everything. And they, and they will, it sounds like you got a lot of flack for the story. But, you know, what, what we've found, 6% of people trust the mainstream news. You know, I mean, actually, your story is more likely to be true than what m maybe people see on the big three news channels. So, um, you know, well, so the fact that you have all this is super amazing. Uh, what were you going to say, David? Go ahead. Well, you know, just simple things like people say, um, you know, oh, your mother never was a nurse. That's all a lie. I said, well, we went to check her retirement records, and her name was removed, and the um, the curator or the uh, the gatekeeper of the retirement thing said, I remember her name being there. Where's her records? And they couldn't find them. So I told the producer, I said, I know another way we can do this. It took me two years through courts, but I went to a place that LeMay could not burn a trail on. I went to Social Security, and we pulled my mother's Social Security records, and there it shows that she was a nurse in 1966 um, at Martin Mem Rowan Martin Memorial Hospital, and she was a coronary care technician and showed the times and dates and all that stuff. Then what you do, you go and get Irving LeMay's death certificate. And look at the dates and where he died. He died at Rowan Memorial Hospital under my mother's care. And there is on his death certificate the time, date, and place exactly matching the Social Security records that my mother was the head nurse of on that third shift. So it's, it's proof positive. How do you Photoshop government documents like that? And they have their court seal stamped on them so that they can be admitted to a court of evidence. So there it proves my mother was there. Irving LeMay's caregiver and Curtis would come in and visit his dad. My mother and him got to know each other. That's how all this started. So there's absolute hard court evidence that all this happened. And, um, and you can check it out yourself. You yeah, can, people can find their own truth. They, they get your DVD, America's Fall yeah. from Space .com. And they find their own truth. And, uh, yeah. you know, David, people like David get put through so much crap. And people oh, like man. Tesla and, you know, Dr. Flanagan. You just watch Dr. Flanagan on Gaia. He's, he's 70 or something. I mean, and he has a very similar story to David. I mean, he worked with the military when he was young. And, and all. I mean, I, I would love for you guys to get together because, and you can just tell. It's almost like he, he, he you can just get a feeling that, man, he went through a lot of shit. But he's he's positive now, but he's 70. I mean, so so to support David and to get the facts, go to America's Fall from Space dot com, buy the DVD. But David, yeah, I believe you. So what happened? So how did you get what happened with your rocket, the one that you built, the the Pithlum, and then how did it land you in Area 51 looking at an alien engine? And then I want to get to your breaking emergency news that you have for us today. OK, um. We're going to, have to skip over so much detail. Exactly. I mean, which people uh, can get uh, on the DVD. Yeah, and all of this stuff, if you watch the DVD, you can, when we show you documents and stuff, you can backtrack it yourself and go to those locations and find the same document that we're showing you. How do you Photoshop that? You can't, unless it's the truth, which it is. Good point. So um, that's the reason I did this, just so put an end to all the noise about it and um but anyway uh so how, how we, did your rocket we, go the first the pith well we mm -hmm. well we got it built we transported it from um where i built it in the shop uh our own shops which were heavily modified and um brought up to date um and we went <laughs> we got a piggly uh, we got a, a semi that had Piggly Wiggly on the side of it, <laughs> <laughs> and um, uh, which is a grocery, stain, uh, grocery store chain. And Pithlin was loaded in it. It was taken to Wright Paris Air Force Base. 
there we loaded it onto a C-141 Starlifter, and um, we flew to right uh, to uh, from Wright Patterson to White Sands, New Mexico, uh, testing ground. The rocket was prepped and it was launched. Crazy story in the launch. We just didn't got time for with this but engine. It, with this engine. Oh, in it? yeah. And was it running on this engine? Oh well, yeah. It operated. It left. I mean, boy, did it leave. Um, it left so fast we didn't see it. And I said I expected that. I said um, it's why I built the rocket body the way I did. I said, could you see a 30 6 bullet leave a rifle barrel? That's how fast it's moving from the get-go. It's, you know, a rocket launch takes off slow, gets faster, 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 and then it goes on outside, right? Sure. Not this thing. This thing's only got two speeds, off and wide open. And it took off from the beginning, and you couldn't even see it. And um, anyway, phones lit up on the desk. It was, it was NORAD, and they said, what are you people doing over there in White Sands? <laughs> uh, well, we had a rocket blow up here. And he goes, well, that blown up rocket, we're tracking it. It's now curving at the apogee at 125 miles up. And then it was, they. well, it's a long story. Other people got involved. They had me reprogram it. It didn't come back to White Sands. It went exactly where we wanted. it. They wanted it in a place called uh, Groom Lake, Nevada, which I had no idea what. Groom Lake was. I pulled out the maps and it's a dry lake bed. And I'm going, why are you dropping this thing in a dry lake bed? You know, it's just, God, how are you going to get to it? Well, I didn't know there was a big base there or anything. Nobody knew. Uh, this is 1971. So anyway, it gets there. And the reason this whole thing happened in LeMay Air Force, all the stuff, picked me and want me and supported me and supplied everything with labs and materials and people and machining um you know and we assembled this thing uh because he wanted and this other guy came in named arthur rudolph look his name up oh buddy what a deal uh, <laughs> arthur rudolph was um he was a he came in through operation paperclip with one of them yeah he's a gestapo and um He's also winner of the most distinguished service award, the highest award NASA can give, because he was the designer, chief designer of the F-1 Saturn V Apollo rocket engines. And but he, in May 24th, 1984, he was deported out of uh, San Francisco to Munich, Germany, where he's held for war crimes. And NASA kept this all quiet, so y'all didn't know anything about it. And that's because he had killed over 100,000 people at Metalworks, where they built the V-2 rockets. Wow. I mean, it's, and that was a guy on my case every minute of the day. Uh, he took over, pissed him, he took over the project. He had it dropped at Area 51. Did he steal your nuclear uh, containment engine? He tried, but um, before he could, I blew it into a million pieces. What happened? Uh, well, I... I found out why they wanted me and my rocket at Groom Lake was because we went skipping over tons of details here. Sure. They tell me, tell me downstairs. I could describe the place in detail. I do in the this film. This is at Area 51, right? Yeah, and uh, we were in the center hangar. The floor drops down. It's a big elevator. We go down. We go to a, another chamber, opens up, and the door was really cool. It's an iris. You know what an iris looks like in a camera? Sure. Anyway, this big iris opened up. This thing's about 50 feet in diameter. So anyway, we went in there, and in this room, they raised up the curtains, um, and these aren't um, cloth curtains. These are like mud flaps from semis that probably weigh tons. You're not going to jerk the curtain up and look underneath it. Obviously, you don't want that. But anyway, I'm skipping over tons of details. So somehow, but, you, um, so you, get, you destroyed your rocket, and... But well, they showed me... The reason they took me there and they raised the curtains in this room and they brought me to, there's an electromagnetic fusion containment engine sitting there, not the size of mine, which is only about two feet long, but the size of an 18-wheel semi. It's what? a it, it's a power plant of, oh my of enormous proportion. It's an electromagnetic fusion containment power plant, complete. Wow. And wow. the way it was built, the construction of it was just insane. Um on my 
engine. I had all kinds of well lines and and metal fasteners and hardware miles of wiring. And this thing, not one weld line, not one seam, not one rivet, what one nut. It looked like it grew like an eggplant. How did you, how did you build that? And um, it's in a perfect configuration. See, the way I could tell with a fusion containment engine is that if you'd take a, a Model A, you know, engine block and lay it down and go get yourself a Lamborghini Contouche uh, engine block and set them by each other, they both look similar because they both are internal combustion engines. Okay. However, however the Lamborghini, you know, got a thousand times the power of that Model A. But nevertheless, they still have the same basic core design. This thing had the same basic core design imprint as mine. And the reason that being is that it's the way the psychotrons and the um, accelerators are built and the way they're configured. Uh, the reason they can't get fusion containment today, they're on the wrong design. They've been on the wrong design for 75 years. Uh, they're still putting in money. Uh, NASA, Princeton, Purdue, all these people spend billions of dollars, and they still hadn't even gotten to, I think it's .007564 of one second containment. In 1971, I had 4.5 seconds. Wow. That's, wow. that's the eternity difference. And uh, it's so, because they're on the wrong damn design. Well, probably and, on purpose. Uh, they're probably being led that way on purpose. And they spend billions and trillions on diseases that probably they could cure with technology built in the 30s as well by Dr. Reif and Lakovsky.